I'm Ernest Marab, I'm the director here at Yumi. Uh, again, thank you for coming. You know, one of the um, reasons that we started this colloquial series is because you know, one of the most important things an institute can do, in addition to research and service in the community, is to train and provide mentoring to the next generation of scholars that are going to take chances and do innovative and important work. And a lot of times, colloquia reserves people that are well on in their career. Um, so one of the things we wanted to do was institute a colloquium for graduate students and, and postdoctoral fellows um, who are doing important work to be able to talk about their work. And we've had uh, folks like Benji Chang and uh, Catherine Vincent uh, who have spoken about work that they, they're doing. Uh, our final one is, uh, is Barry Goldenberg, who uh, is a master's student now uh, in history of education. And I've known Barry uh, for probably five or six years, yeah. uh, since his freshman year at UCLA, when he took uh, one of my classes when I was a professor there. And uh, you can't have a more cheerful and happy disposition than you know Barry. But uh, I was thinking about that. That can sometimes belie um, what I think is the heart and soul of a serious social justice someone who is serious and has committed his life to this point um, to the pursuit of equity um, and is um, you know uh, kind of a, a fearless uh, uh, young scholar and what I'll talk about today uh, I can remember conversations it was uh, maybe three or four years ago um, when you get to a point in your life where you know that you're reading things in books, but this is something that I want to dedicate my life to, but I have to get out of these books and out into the world. I have got to, to see this and live it if it's, if it's truly going to be who I am existentially. And I can remember Barry at that point um, in, in his undergraduate years where you know, there, there was a lot of theory and things going on that, you know, good stuff, but uh, and he said, you know, I want to go to South Africa. When you write me a letter, that's a great thing to do. I, from St. Louis to Los Angeles to you know, going to South Africa. And uh, I can also remember, you know, I taught Barry um, after he came back from South Africa. And um, I could see that he was already becoming a different person, the Barry that we know now. Uh, this is the first time, really, that uh, other than conversations in the office, where I think we have a, like a substantive conversation about how that experience in South Africa is yeah. really shaping your views around race, um, around purpose of education, um, what, it, what it means to advocate for social justice and the work that you do. Uh, so it gives me great, great pleasure to introduce Barry Goldenberg and to turn over to him to talk about his experiences in South Africa. Well, thank you so much again. Um, thank you everyone for being here. It's, it's a pleasure. It's really an honor to be here. To, to kind of share these ideas, and as Professor Morel said, this this trip before I get into it, it had a definitely a you know profound impact on on myself emotionally, not just intellectually but emotionally. And um, I haven't had it's been it'll be you know I'll talk about um, two years from this summer, and I've never really had a chance to um, to to share it. And I've been wanting to do that for a while, and this is just a great opportunity to do so. So again, thank you for listening, and hopefully it's engaging. And um, it, I just can't thank you enough for giving us an opportunity to uh, to do so. So. I'm going to try to imagine taking you guys to Cape Town. That's the goal of the, uh, the presentation. Um, um, so I guess just a quick overview before I get to the, the meat of it all. Um, I went, this was after my junior year at UCLA, and I you know, had read a lot of theory and, and, and all this you know, books on, on, on race and education. I was kind of entering into this social justice world, and I was decided I'm just going to go and, and do this, and, and I, need, I needed it. Um, but uh, I went from August 4th to September 20th in 2010, uh, about seven weeks. It's at the very end of the World Cup, so they kind of still had the World Cup fever, just to give you a context of, of you know, when I was going. And, and so I spent all seven weeks in Cape Town. And for those who have never, uh, don't know where that is, because I didn't know where it is, I'd never left the country before I went. Um, I'm at the bottom, Let's see it's interactive here. And then um, go to Cape Town, the very bottom. I was somewhere, in between those mountains, here's where all the wealthy whites are, the townships are over there. So I was somewhere in the middle, in this table mountain. Oops. And that is, so I lived, uh, so I volunteered, oh, it's okay. Uh, yeah. I volunteered at, at a school, it's called Crystal House Academy. Um, it's kind of like, um, it's kind of like the best way to describe it is like, like the Oprah schools. 
um, Oprah School. It was uh, um, um, a wealthy white woman who owns these schools across the country, and she wants it's all it's kind of private, independent of, of itself. And she, you know, just to, taking the poorest kids from the townships and giving them you know free preschool. Um, so I technically let's see if I can pull this up. Um, um, I, technically, I was supposed to work with the, the guidance counselor. Uh, that was like my specific role, um, helping the matriculants, that's what they call the 12th graders, matriculants, not graduates, uh, find scholarships, apply to colleges, prepare for exams, um, anything I could help her to do that. That was my official role of capacity. I ended up being like a utility man, pretty much whatever they needed to do. I filled in, you know, in the classroom one day and whatnot. I also said, I live in the city, um, and I was placed at this school through, I. There's this program called Connect One Two Three that fi finds people who, who want to volunteer in Cape Town, find you housing and internship. And I was one of in education, so they kept me with Crystal House, and that's how that happened. If it sounds crazy, it was kind of as impulsive as crazy as it sounds. So, um, so that's the um, overview of my trip. So, as I said, so I'm going to start. You know, we're going to work our way like, to why South Africa. We're going to work our way down, kind of how the theory that impacted me to to make me want to go and do this. Uh, and then we'll go through my trip at August 4th, and we end up September 20th. I come back home, I change man. No, but uh, it did have an impact. <laughs> but um, then we'll work our way up to, to moving forward to, to now. And so I'm gonna, gonna begin with that. So, you know, why, um, so why South Africa, not anywhere else? And so up to this point, I'd read a lot of theory, and so my biggest interest was, was, uh, was, was race. And I, I grew up in the suburbs in Chesterfield, Missouri, half an hour outside of St. Louis, never really thought of race before. Um, and so I started reading about the kind of the, the, the white, non-white binary. And I, the big, a big book, an idea that had an impact on me was Charles Mills' book on the racial contract in terms of this whole white, non-white existence that I was a part of. I never thought of that before. I never even really thought of that, um, that I was part of this contract, that I was, that I was white and other people were not white. This this whole concept was this this, this, this grammar. I was like, you know, this this is crazy, you know, and the whole idea of whiteness uh, was considered the norm. I, I want to explore that, and I explore that in my studies a little bit, but I wanted to explore it in person. So, um, I guess in South Africa, um, just as um, back in there, apartheid, I think 19 years ago, so they were still segregated. So the tensions are still very real um, when I went there um, between whites and blacks. Um, so I had this whole idea of rethinking race. You know, I had a really good friend in high school. And um, he was from the city. We had a desegregation program in my high school. And he'd come over, sleep over at my house after basketball and after choir and stuff. And it felt normal that he was coming into my suburb white community. Never thought of that um, as anything less than normal. And, but the, you know, so I, you know, it seemed normal to me. And so the idea of, of me going into the black community, his community, seemed abnormal. I never really realized why, would, why, why was that? You know, why was that so? Um, so when I started reading this theory, I was like, you know, there's wow, you know, this is. It's just it mind boggling me, and I want to explore this, and 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 so and this whole idea of you know, Edward Taylor critical race theory it says you know it's hard to comprehend the non-white experience that white domination has produced, and and so if I explored explored that, you know what kind of emotions, biases, and prejudice would come out um, during such a trip, and, and and I decided going to South Africa would be a good way to do so, and and, uh, and I got to you know leave the country, and which I've never done, and and um, explore these thoughts and. And, and no, I'll never be the other, and not that I'm trying to be, but at least in the context that I was at, um, what would it feel like to be the other and where I was living and working all the time? Um, so that was kind of my racial ideology, why I wanted to go explore those interests. And also, I wanted to go, you know, help the kids, you know, impart knowledge and, and, and uh, offer my services to them and the whole kind of the liberal framework that we so often hear. And, um, and so that was another reason, too, I wanted to, you know, do some really, you know, do good things and out of my fair to LA life that I was so becoming, you know, so privileged to have, and I was kind of getting sucked into that, and I wanted to kind of escape a little bit. But you know, I also problematized this later in terms of my scope and positionality of wanting to, you know, help them, and they actually they helped me a lot more than I could ever imagine. So that 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 changes throughout. So keep that in mind. And um, so I did have a few theoretical frameworks before I jump into all the pictures and videos and fun stuff to kind of have some kind of an academic presentation uh, today. Um, so go, it's going into, um, as Professor Merrill said, I had read a lot and I was starting to internalize a lot of things and a couple of things really influenced my mindset before I went that when I was thinking, when I was writing, when I was there, um, that you could, probably can tell things had an impact. Um, this sort of idea of organic intellectuals, and, and it's, it's sort of a misreading in a way because I'm you know, part of that dominant structure, 
but this whole idea, you know, put forth by Gramsci in the 70s, but the whole idea that I, I never considered myself intellectual as the first person to go to college. My family never considered I could be, I could theorize about the world. And so I kind of internalized that and grabbed hold of that, that I really could um, be intellectual. So when I went to South Africa, I could write and think about the world in ways that people with PhDs could. I, that really, that really um, resonated with me, that, you know, that I could not just read the word, but the world, as, as Graham said. So that had a big impact. I mean, of course, in critical theory, um, this idea of a self-conscious uh, critique of what's going on, critiquing the world, and, and it doesn't have to be in this you know, super scientific way that uh, you know in, in, in traditional traditional framework um, or the Frankfurt School. So that I was reading this theory, and that I could you know that I would critique you know what I'm doing, where I am, why I think the way I think, um, and of course um, critical race theory, which I alluded to, had a huge impact on on my thinking. And you know, the, as a white scholar, it meant something you know different to other people. And um, you know, I, I started reading about these stories about you know, revealing institutional racism, confronting microaggressions that myself was a part of, and you know, emphasizing these marginalized voices in, in CRT and acknowledging that white supremacy exists. This whole idea that um, that a racism is normal. You know, you have scholars, Lads and Billings, and Derek Bell, and Crenshaw in terms of the, the origins of the law, and William Tate, Delgado, and floors I know at UCLA, and I started reading all this, and it was, you know, it, it was just, it was so new to me, and I wanted to continue exploring this, and so these had an impact on my way of thinking, and, and what I considered, and so, of course, maybe the most important is, is the framework of love, I have to put in, I work with my mom, she'll be happy when she sees this, she doesn't know this is in here, <laughs> but it's true, because whenever I wanted to go, and I wanted to, I wanted to have warmth with the kids, and with my work, and what I'm doing, and I never wanted to lose that. Dr. Morrell talks about that a lot. It's had a big impact on the way I think about my work and think about myself in relation to others. Um, so with those four things in mind, I will kind of created my mindset prior to jumping on the plane 13 hours, which I had no idea what I was in store for. <laughs> um, didn't sleep an hour, I was so anxious. Um, so in terms of my research method, so every day I wrote each night as an online blog so people could read it, but it was also notes for myself, and I wrote each day um, each night. So after seven weeks, I had 100 pages of single space notes that I've never really gone through my feelings. So it, it was a very um, untraditional eth ethnography type of work that I did. So um, so I recorded my thoughts and feelings and my experiences. And of course, photos and videos. And at the end, here's a video of, of the school that I worked at, Crystal House. Um, to give you an idea, we'll talk about it later. I don't want to take too much time with this, but it's promoting itself. Kind of like the Oprah's is what we do for the But as I also mentioned quickly, um, so this was my junior year after at UCLA, and so I went in the summer. And when I came back, I read Life in Schools by Peter McLaren. He and he's a white teacher in inner city Toronto, you know, writing, you know, wanting to, you know, help the kid to do really be a, this awesome white teacher, and you know, he records all these things, and later later he goes and critiques that experience and talks about it. And so I kind of got the idea to do the same for my experience because I know it changed me. I had all these notes, but I never had gone back to do that. And, I've been wanting to do that for a while now, and I wanted to do it last year, and this is finally an opportunity for me to do so this summer, so um, thanks for listening, first of all, but that was kind of this idea in terms of talking, looking at my experience and critiquing how it changed, how it impacted me, ways I still have to grow. Um, so with that being said, let's go to Cape Town. You guys ready? <laughs> so this is my timeline. Um, we'll work our way through. So, um, so August 10th was my first day of school. I got there a few days before. Um, kind of getting acclimated. It was my first day of, of work, quote unquote. And I still use those quotes because it really wasn't work. Um, and so remember, I'm, these passages I'm pulling out of, of all these notes that I had that I thought were important. This is you know from the first day of school, and I say you know I'm white and the school is entirely black. And also, in terms of the kind of it was almost this kind of racial caste in South Africa. And I still like to say it, but I mean it was basically uh, black was the bottom, and then people who were, who were lighter skinned were, were considered colored. And that's just how. What we know what they were considered, and then of course whites. And so I said, I'm white in the school. And I said, at first it's a little odd, right? But it's all in my head, it's all in our head. So I'm, I'm, I'm justifying how you know I felt this kind of racial dynamic, but it was just kind of it was, it was in my head. Nothing happened to, to, to really show that I was out of place. Never, but in my head I felt that I was out of place. And so I remember writing that. Uh, this is a picture of of the kid, the kids in the assembly, um, um, younger kids. And so that first day. Um, is, is, is moving forward to my second day. Um, my, some of my media reflections are kind of on students' as poverty because I'm, you know, I'm seeing this up close. And, and even though, and as I'll talk about, I think in this, in this paragraph, um, or later I'll discuss in terms of kind of seeing it up close, but um, um, 
I'm saying obviously the conditions are much better at home than where I am. The instability in the homes, neighborhoods undoubtedly, undoubtedly create exaggerated problems in the education system. Do I know the solution? No. I wish I knew the answer, but I don't. Maybe there is no solution, but this is real, and we take for granted our lives and how fortunate we all are, plain and simple. You hear about it on TV about, about the poverty, and you see the pictures, but the gravity of the situation becomes a lot more real when you are sitting across from a kid who is living through this nightmare. So this idea that, you know, I mean, and, and not that I hadn't, I, didn't, I knew the kids were poor, I knew about that type of poverty, but once you, you work with kids who are so lively every day, really, it puts things in perspective. And so I, I talk about this a lot throughout. I don't put it too much in my timeline, that's always a theme. Um, there's some kids at recess, so, I, like I said, I worked with the older kids specifically, um, but during recess I would try to go and, and you know, talk with the kids and play, play games, and I, as I, I start speaking, they'll like, oh, so this is the click language, I'll get to that later, so I'd interact with them, and, when I, and so I didn't actually, take, most of these pictures from the latter half of my trip, um, I actually didn't really take my camera the first few weeks, I didn't really want to, I didn't know how to navigate that, I didn't know, because I didn't feel like I should, I didn't want to go in and be taking pictures of the kids, that wasn't my goal, and so, it was towards the end that I started to you know, have a relationship with, with the staff and the students. And so this is the picture I took of the younger kids at recess. I think, I think they actually were leaving. Um, but right at the camera, they couldn't wait. So can I take a picture? Yes, 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 with those. And they're all fighting to get in. But, um, um, so this is, a big, this is a big day moving forward for Alex 18. This is a quote from the, that you used the other day. Um, but this, this really hit home with me. And, and so to put in context, so this is 18, so I've been there for over a week now, and uh, one of the days, this is kind of my utility man position, where I was, um, I have to usually I help with like the, the track and field, the athletics they call, but one day a fourth grade teacher needed someone to kind of sub from 3.30 to 4.30, um, just to kind of supervise kind of worksheet, she had to go somewhere. And I was a little nervous and anxious, my first time actually being in the classroom myself with the kids, you know, so I was a little, I wasn't sure what was going to go on, but you know, I was, that was, that's the context, so I'm kind of going to this classroom as a teacher for an hour, in a way. Um, so I write, you know, you, you, I said, you know, kids are kids. I'll read this because I think this is a powerful paragraph. When I, it's, been, it's, it's probably the most troubling paragraph, too, because when I, when I critique it, I really like, I can't believe I said those things, but we'll talk about that. So I said, you know, kids are kids. They are troublemakers, getting out of their seats and stealing pencils, don't ask, as well as the good kids trying to help me quiet the class and sitting quietly doing their work. It's crazy. You kind of forget that these kids and their entire families live in less than $350 a month in the poorest areas. It's hard to describe. I mean, they're driving me crazy, kids being kids. But that's not my point. It's so easy to hear these stories about poverty in Africa, or in Los Angeles too, I wrote in parentheses, I think that they are inferior to us. I mean, it's only natural. I'm not necessarily condemning anyone who feels that way, because it's hard, admittedly not to, when many of us grow up in such well-off households, loving families, which is another troubling thing, to, which I'll talk about, and stress-free childhoods. But when I was in that classroom and always at that school, I mean, you would not really know that these kids live in extreme poverty. They are normal kids. Black, white, rich, poor. I mean, kids really are kids. And I don't necessarily mean that in a bad or good way. It just is what it is. Even though Crystal House serves disadvantaged kids, I say kids a lot. I probably can improve my language there. <laughs> um, you still have your troublemakers, in which I problematize, quote unquote, your scholars, your athletes, et cetera, et cetera. Yet don't we all feel like they are less intelligent or less social or less of a person because of the poverty they live in? And this comes from the media and our sense of disconnection from it all. It is almost a normalcy that takes place in the classrooms and that actions add to the kids that is most shocking and eye-opening. You're probably shaking your head reading some of this as I go back and I said that, um, which I'll get to. But first I said, you know, why did I feel kids were inferior? Was it my middle class you know, positionality? Um, but even more kind of problematizing what I said, you know, I blame, I blame the media for these feelings. I blame, you know, and, and there's no doubt the whole perception of black and brown youth, that, that's true, the way, the way youth are perceived in the media and in books and whatnot. But as I've been reading in theory and I'm feeling that there's a lot, it was a lot more than that. I, I couldn't pick up on that at the time, you know. Um, it was the whole idea of, you know, institutional racism and my own prejudice and biases that I inherently had. Even though I'm critiquing this experience and saying I can't believe it's like that, I still was not even able to recognize myself that I had biases and prejudice at the time. And that, there's, there's something more to why I felt that way. It wasn't just the media. So when I go back, and this is a powerful passage, how I didn't even pick up on that. I guess that's a continued growing experience. You know, I still continue to grow, and I will tomorrow. And, and another another passage, um, I say loving families. I, so which is like, I go back and I say, you know, I equate loving households with socioeconomic status. Even in my critique, I still am guilty of unconscious notions of prejudice and bias. And so when I go back on this, I can't believe that I equated a loving household with high socioeconomic status. So it's, it just shows how, because my point in research-wise, connecting to my research questions, it goes to show how powerful 
these racist, you know, notions are in my upbringing in society, the way I've internalized it, I wasn't even aware of. And I'm sure there's still things I'm not aware of now, but as I critique that, I realize um, I don't know what more I'm going to go. And I also said troublemakers too, quote unquote. You know, what are troublemakers? How did I receive troublemakers? Was, it, was that the resistance of kids that I was failed to recognize? And, that, and so there's a lot in that passage that, and that was a big day, I remember writing that. Um, uh, thinking about this kind of superiority, inferiority complex that I, that I was working through. Um, so moving forward here, let's see. And the next day is August 24th. I, I, I entitle it Minority State. And these, are, these titles are what I entitle it now. This is kind of my reflecting back. The passages were original when I wrote it. And you can still, I think they're still online if you want to see them. So they're, they're, they're legit. So, um, so just to put this in, in context, coincidentally, there was a, a film festival that day, um, like the, that week in Cape Town, like International Film Festival. Um, and so I went to say, oh, this is, this is cool. You know, I'll go see the film and, uh, with a friend. And this film is called On the Other Side of Life. And it's basically it's about two kids in the townships, just kind of growing up in the townships, with them every day, amazing footage and whatnot, just what their life was like, their frame for a murder they didn't do. It was basically about their lives and, and connect here. And so I went to see this film. And, and of course, this is the theater. And as everything in Cape Town, I really think of this whole idea of you know, being colonized. Um, everything, everything in the city is, when you walk outside, Every, everyone's black, but every institution is, is white. Like the gym I went to was white. You know, if I walked outside, I was black. But I don't even know how people got there. Which I mean, you know, I, I walked, but um, you know, the theater was was mostly all white people inside. And anyway, so we're watching this movie, and before I talk about this passage, we're watching this documentary, and basically the whole audience is white, except for a few of the, the family members in, who were actually in the movie, who were close up, as the, um, and they were black. And, and there was some tension in the room that happened after the director was there and they started talking about the movie. And so again, about that, just to kind of put in perspective also, um, you see the, the demographics in South Africa. Um, it's probably, and that's all in South Africa. Cape Town was probably um, well, more blacks in um, <coughs> Cape Town. But anyway, so, so think of that context in the movie. And so this is after um, the movie. Um, I said, said that millions of white Afrikaners, and Afrikaners are the whites uh, who, uh, in South Africa who live in the country and probably have no idea the life of people in the townships, and neither do we. But it's actually disturbing and gut-wrenching that people who live in South Africa have never been to a township or learned anything about the large millions of people who live in their own country. I never thought about this concept before, that you know, this 9% doesn't know anything about the 91%. Um, I said, Cape Town is a city with a majority of people, um, so on and so forth. Um, said, they're the ones whose culture language is veered upon as inferior by the 10% African culture and population. It's absurd. You know, this majority white audience listened to the Plosa language because it was in Plosa and then they had subtitles at the bottom. So there, so they, someone mentioned in a, a, a question and answer, the majority white audience listened to the Plosa language being spoken as so the whole thing was ridiculous. Like, why was it in that language, you know? I, you know, you get, you get this feeling chilling straight to the soul that I wrote that the black Plosa family was out of place, but why? I know for a fact that many white people have no idea about the culture and language of basically the entire area of where they live. And never thought about that before in that context. And I actually, a little even more context in South Africa. I worked as a camp counselor at UCLA teaching tennis, and one of my friends was from Cape Town. She's a white Afrikaner. So actually, I, I met with her. When we hung out one day, and I was told I took some classes in Plosa. She's like, why are you learning that language? And, you know, not Afrikaans. Cause, and that's so it hit me, like, you know, why would you not want to learn it? That's what most people speak. And if you want to be bilingual, I, you know. And so it's, you get this idea that this minority state is really, I mean, it, it's like that in the U.S. in ways, and, but in South Africa, it's really, really exacerbated. It, it, it was, I never thought about that concept before, in terms of building a cultural solidarity with, with the people you're working with and learning from. So, and, and also the whole kind of image in South Africa, the whole aura, this is the World Cup, let's all come together, and especially emphasize there about you know, whites and blacks, this is really, we all need to come together, you know, and, and, and even my friend and her parents, she volunteer, they volunteered and stuff, and said, oh, the country's coming together and whatnot, and I kept thinking, now, how can a country come together when one race makes no effort to learn and appreciate the culture and communities of the people they praise to come together with? And again, this was new to me because when I originally came in, I was going to learn Afrikaans. I think on my first blog, I started learning a few things. I said, and then I really, I don't really, I probably should learn the language of the kids who I'm working with, right? You know? <laughs> and um, on top of other things. So that was a big, that was also interesting when I, when I think about. And obviously, I also don't want to make too many connections in a way because. The South African context is very different than the United States in, in a lot of ways, but also in a lot of ways it's also very similar. And, and you can say is the U.S. any different in, in ways? So that's a, you can think about that yourself. And also, anytime, just shout out, raise your hand, push back. I mean, this is 
Um, hopefully you'll still be engaging in a way. You know, I went to ARA a few weekends ago and the whole the the, the different the different chairs, each one's presentation and question at the end. This not this is obviously a little beyond the, the, the norm, so please feel free to comment any time and, and push me back on this because this continues to be a learning experience. This is the first time I've shared these these feelings um, to anyone really. Um, so moving forward, so August twenty fourth is uh, called keeping the status quo. Um, let's see. I, I know how important the days were because how big the text is. That's how I kind of emphasized when I was going back and reading all these. But so keeping the status quo. Um, and oh, this is another day. I saw another film. This was it was called RFK and Land of Apartheid. So when Robert Kennedy visited uh, South Africa to to go against apartheid, which was actually a really big thing because the government at the time didn't like it, but they couldn't stop it because he's an American figure. And so I saw this documentary, and this inspired me. But again, this, 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 uh, it was the all-white audience. And, the, and it was actually a special day, I was able to kind of sneak in, actually, um, for the University of Stellenbosch, like alumni. And the University of Stellenbosch was an all-white Afrikan um, university. You know, now it's open, but it's still largely white. But at the time, that was like pro-apartheid, full Afrikan um, university. That's actually made a picture in one of the buildings there. I wear the same yellow South African jacket every day. Don't make fun of me. I want to fit in. Okay, just, you'll see that. So, <laughs> but uh, and, you, and you see my hair getting longer each day too. I didn't get a haircut for two months. Anyway, so um, I went. But uh, anyway, back going back to the movie. Going back to the movie. Um, there's course question and answers with the director who was there for the movie because it's a film festival. Um, and so people were kind of questioning each other. So I wrote other Afrikaners in the film question why they necessarily support apartheid, but they support it as the status quo. And one, one man wrote, you know, he's older now, and he said, you know, I, I support it because that's just the way it was. And then, you know, now he's thinking year, years later, they obviously understand the cruelness and the unbelievable things that took place. And I kept thinking about, doesn't it sound like art history in a way? Like, I, I, talk, I talk about the 60 layer in that blog, and, and obviously there's some differences, but I mean, I kept thinking, like, you know, the status quo, I mean, it's, it sounds like art history, you know, in so many ways. You know, I, you know, I just wrote in my thing, when we spark a revolution and not accept the status quo for our children, can I get back to education? You know, the status quo is not a good answer, you know. And I wrote my favorite uh, document, I always talk about youth, and I love this quote, RFK talked about youth, and that's a great time, I'll, I'll say it. So, our answer is the world's hope it is to rely on youth. The cruelties and obstacles of the swiftly changing planet will not yield to obsolete dogmas and outworn slogans. It cannot be moved by those who cling to a present which is already dying. Who prefer the illusion of security to the excitement and danger which comes with even the most peaceful progress. I love that quote. And so that was the trailer of the film I saw. And, um, so that, that was an interesting experience. Um, I always enjoy those, those film festivals because it, it's an interesting dynamic of, of what's being shown and how the audience would react. Um, so um, we're working my way through now. I'm almost halfway through my trip. Um, I think so. this next one is called Making Meaning. So this is just a reflection on, on what I've experienced so far. I remember like talking about one of my blogs, oh, I've, I've come this far, you know, how have I changed, what have I noticed, and, and whatnot. So this is just a brief, brief blog reflecting on my, my halfway point. Um, I said, now I'm at the stage where I have to cherish my remaining days here and lose the awe factor. Instead, of bottle that up to help me use what I've learned, felt, and experience to making me a better person. And academically and educationally, making me someone who thinks more about the world around him. Um, you know, does that make sense? These two weeks will have their own sets of challenges, but I want to make sure I internalize these extraordinary experiences and the knowledge of exciting new people and take that back home and use that at home in my heart and in my head at school. And, and I want to emphasize this blog just not because of that, but because at this point I was really starting to connect with the students and the faculty and the staff and, and I was starting to actually have some friendships. And this is when I started taking my camera a little more just to, you know, talk with the kids who I felt comfortable and they wouldn't, you know, felt comfortable with me taking a picture of them and whatnot. So, so I wanted to stress that. So here's a few pictures of some kids. I mean, there's some of the older kids. Um, the one on the left is Martha. She came to visit me all the time. She's 11th grader, president of her class, super bright. Um, uh, we actually still kept in touch a little bit. Um, and these are two kids at recess. You can see the kids playing in the background. There's this field in the back and play soccer and run around and whatnot. So I'm chowing down and, and they're saying hello. Um, again, same jacket. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> my wardrobe wasn't the best when I was there, but uh, so, uh, here's two uh, two older kids, high school. Um, her, she's Yolanda. I forgot the, the girl in the last name. She, but she was a sister of a brother I worked with who was in the grade 12, whose name was Bulaney. I actually visited his house in a home visit, which I'll talk about later, which was a very powerful experience. Um, 
So we took a picture together. Um, Here's a video, you guys. What okay, let me uh, uh, free context. Uh, so this is one of my favorite videos I had. So um, again, this is during recess in the latter half of my trip. Um, the girl on the left, when she you know found you know I was from America, she thought I was like an actor, a celebrity, I'm like. Hollywood, I'm like, no, I'm not an actor, but she continued to ask me, do you know Rihanna, do you know Usher? And I was like, no, I don't. As much as I started to say, yes, I do, but it's easier. But no joke, and so I was like, hey, can I take a video of you? And she said, oh, yes, yeah, you want to talk to the camera and say hi. I'm like, so, okay, so this is, this is great. So, um, I think I can, um, cool, here we go, I've got my cool technology here. I'm going to do this. Okay. the video, you guys, what do you guys want to say? But this is obviously during recess, and I'd always walk around and talk with the kids and, and interact with them because you know I worked with the older kids, you know, so it was nice to get a chance to, to see the youth sometimes um, in that context. <clears throat> so I want to trust there that I'm starting to connect with, with, with the kids a lot more. So September 3rd, I said, Is it us or is it them? Um, it's a small day, but I think it's, it's as also because you know my whole idea of acknowledging race and uh, I'm acknowledging it more, so I will. Oops. I'll read this. Um, I said, oh, as another pre-context. So I'm not sure if anyone followed the World Cup very closely and watched the news. Uh, there's one place called the Zolis. It was on the news one, a couple times. Um, it was, so it was this, this restaurant in uh, Guguletsu, which was one of the, maybe the most stereotypical, you know, dangerous township. Yeah, but there was this restaurant. And, you know, whites went there, tourists went there. It was one of the few, I said, maybe only, I don't know, of places like, you know, in a black township where everybody went, including whites. So it was kind of this famous, they have barbecue and they call things braai. I don't ever say barbecue, I don't know what that is. So if you go to South Africa, don't say barbecue, it's always braai. But you know, they would braai food and this is kind of the place where you would go. So I went with a bunch of the, the teaching assistants who I became really close friends with. Um, and so I want to pre-contact that. So I write, um, where whites go to Black Towns, so it's one of the few places. And I, you know, so I, I write, so it's unfortunate I have to mention that. Um, is it unfortunate? You know, I, that's, I can critique that now. but. Um, and anyway, I so said, a few of my coworkers who go to the Zolis every weekend, excuse me, and I were talking about how awesome this place is because everyone is welcome here whenever and what, and that is what makes it special. It didn't matter that I was white and they were black in a black neighborhood. It was totally cool. The people I went with were so excited to take me, though I was probably more excited just to be there, to the Zolis to show me their local hangout and how welcoming they are to an immense outsider like me, enjoy being in their part of town, which they are typically speaking all together as friends. And so I was just kind of reflecting on, you know, I was reflecting on the divide in South Africa in terms of, you know, you know, everyone wants to come together. And that, that, that rhetoric is like everywhere, especially when I went with the World Cup. I can't emphasize that enough. And I, I, was, and I wrote, I realized that at large it was not blacks who wanted to be divided, but whites who were unaware of their implicit refusal to culturally acknowledge blacks, at least in Cape Town. So I was extremely welcomed. You know, it, was, it wasn't like they were, they were, you know, my friends were so excited to show me, you know, she lived up, up the street. Uh, you know, and it wasn't like, it wasn't the other way around. And so, so this picture um, is one of my, probably my best friends South Africa. We still keep in touch. We actually talked not too long ago. Her name was Amanda. She was teaching assistant for, I think, the second graders. Um, and yeah, so one of my good friends. And that's is also the, the, the place. There's music, a lot of drinking, a lot of music, and, and the townships around you. So this is this, this uh, kind of unique place in this context. Um, so we're working our way through here. We're, we're getting closer to the end. Um, but if, if there's any, this is probably another a really big day for me. And I'm, you know, as I'm going, I realize, you know, I, I'm reading back a little bit. I'm reflecting each day, and I realize I've been building and building, and things are changing in my thoughts compared to where I was when I wrote that one thing about troublemakers and the loving households. And it doesn't change. I mean, I still have things like critique. I can't believe I said that. But by and large, you know, I see some change. And you know, as I read this, and so I write this one. We've got it all wrong. And this is when I really start to conceptualize the, the us versus them that I know Dr. Mel talks about, and I was thinking about this then. 
So this is a lot of paragraphs, but I'm going to read this because I think it's powerful. And so I write deeply rooted prejudices that I had. Um, so this is after, I guess to context this, I went to the first time I went to the townships inside. Um, and I, um, to, to visit home, to do a home visit with the social worker. We had talked about doing it. I hadn't had a chance to do it yet for scheduling things, and she hadn't gone. So this is the first time I actually went to actually go to, to the homes of some where my kid lived. Um, and I, mean, I was nervous. I was really nervous to go. I was scared. I was, I, you know, even though I knew that everything would be fine, <laughs> you know, I know, I know the, I've been working with the kids for weeks now. I know the staff. I've read the literature. I know everything is going to be okay. It's not a big deal to go into the townships, you know, as a white guy or whatnot. But I was still nervous. I, I admit, I was still, I still had these kind of these prejudices. They were so deeply rooted. And even though I knew, I knew better. I couldn't help. Those were still there. And so, you know, of course, I went, and it was, of course, it was an amazing experience. It wasn't all what I knew it wasn't going to be, but I still thought it might be, you know. So and I, write the, I write these long blogs, and I remember I poured it out that night. And I, I said, I'll leave you with this observation. We have it wrong. I say, well, what is it? People, Africa, townships, poverty, communities, life. And by the way, this is unedited, so some of my language and, and everything. I know you professor, you know, it's, uh, my language isn't the best, but... Um, just kind of pouring it out. So I said, what is it? People, African townships, poverty, communities, life. People are all full of misconceptions that we can even internalize. I went down to one of these townships full of poverty. What did I expect to see? Guns back everywhere, people outside doing drugs, walking to the house to see a disgusting mess, parents drinking or smoking, the kids nowhere to be found. You know, we, and I'm talking about myself, I guess, you know, we all have these ideas and images in our head of what these areas are supposed to be like and what these people are supposed to act like. What has become of us? All we hear is that they, blacks where I was, or I said Hispanics in LA, and the list goes on, don't want to improve you know, their life. They don't care about a good education for their children. They are all lazy people who take from the government, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all these horrible things. We should all be ashamed of ourselves. And then I, I continue. You know, I walked into one of, student, one of my students' homes. It was a tiny room with the kitchen the size of a medium-sized dining room table connected to another room the size of a dining room table, et cetera. It was very, very tiny. Okay, it was tiny. Um, the place was well kept, clean, with the cabinet decorated with their kids' awards, medals, certificates, and a few baby pictures. I went outside and talked with my student, a clean cut, awesome guy with much going for him. You saw his younger sister earlier. Uh, said no guns, no mess, no drugs, but a family and genuine people living the best they could with the life they had been given. And then one more I say, my point is this, is there violence and drugs that exist in the area? Well, sure. Are there people who don't try to improve their lives? Well, I'm sure there are. But you know, I'll tell you. There are just as so many people who are not like the they excuses that we somehow are better to believe. Gosh, we are wrong. We, we are ever so wrong about the they. And if there's any day that was so powerful, it was that day going into townships. And I knew it would be powerful. I knew, I knew what I was thinking was wrong, but yet I still thought that. So the fact that I was still thinking that meant there's, there's some kind of deeply prejudiced um, you know, notions I had been bred to believe over the course of my you know, 22 years growing up in the suburb and whatnot. Um, so that was a powerful day for me. Um, so these are just rhetorical questions that I think about. You know, why was I mentally so nervous about going to these townships? You know, why did I have these misconceptions despite knowing better? Why did I not expect to be welcomed to the homes of my students? All these things that I, I, you know, I couldn't, that I, 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 I could not grapple with. And I still have a trouble grappling with it. Isn't it like I, those, those, those fears all go away one trip? I mean, those are, those are things I think as, 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 as white, even a white scholar, we would continue to work through. I mean, that was a big day for me. Um, but in, in, at least thinking about that dichotomy of they versus us, we versus them, I never thought about that before, but that's how society is constructed in, in so many ways, and how I was implicitly part of that we, I never thought of myself as being a part of that we before. Even though I met all good, saved the world, you know, I'm going to help, you know, I never thought that I was a part of that still. Um, these are a few pictures of the townships. I didn't take pictures of the, the, those actual houses I went. I went another day, we went to a, a tour um, for some of the staff. Um, this is one house, this is a more decent house. Um, some are like this. They're small, but they're one room. Others are informal settlements. These are, this, I think this is Langa. Um, these are all communities our students are from. Some are from better houses, some are from not. These are informal settlements. And this is another more formal settlement with, with rows. And then another informal settlement. I think this is Joe Slovo, I think. Um, so, of course, that was a big day. Another day in terms of, I'm talking about my favorite uh, language connection. Um, <clears throat> so, and this is just a reflection of how much I love the language and how I, t I took some classes. I had a little book and a CD I practiced at night uh, speaking Tlosa, which is the click language. Um, I, I still know a little bit. So, uh, I learned to speak Tlosa. It's pretty cool. So I know some basic stuff. But anyway, so I was me reflecting on this. 
reflecting on my me learning more and more. So I said my love for Kelosa and the people has grown despite all this amazing tour stuff I'm doing, which was awesome. I did the hiking, I did all the core stuff because I was still there on the weekends. Um, and we'll do this weekend. I think I was I think I was going to hike the eleventh that weekend. I said the best part of my trip, hands down, has been interacting with the local people and speaking closer with them. I was walking back to the market today and stopped by the by one man, a security guard in front of a hotel, and we talked some close, like, you know, hi, how are you, those type of things. And like almost every person here, he was shocked that this young white American tourist was speaking his language. And he and, and like the lady I talked to at the market, I was, you know, you buy goods and, and whatnot. The staff at Crystal House, every person I meet, extremely grateful, appreciative, and excited that I'm interested in this language culture. It is an immensely rewarding experience that no of you know of our activity can replace. I will miss it greatly. And I still think of all the things I did, the most rewarding was speaking the language. Um, just that, that, that type of that culture, that type of solidarity, that type of bond, it was just it was amazing. And and, and, and that goes back to what I was talking about before, that the fact that I mean, by and large, I mean, whites really don't know any of the language as a white American tourist. It was just, it was like so shocking. I would say like, you know, Molo to, to, to someone on the street. And, and it was like, you know, it was like, you know, wow, you've taken an interest. And that, I think, obviously there's no big context, different context from here and there, but still, I mean, it was very, very powerful. And this was, and, I, and I've talked about before, you know, I, and I say, let me connect here. Um, uh, here we go. Um, oops, there we go. And I say Spanish in the United States. And obviously the context is different in a lot of ways. Um, but you know, I took Spanish in high school, and you know, I got A's as well, and whatnot. But I never felt it was important to learn. Never really wanted to learn. Never really cared to learn. Did it because it was a class and whatnot. When I came to UCLA, I actually tried to enroll in Spanish because I felt I should carry it, but I couldn't get in my first quarter for scheduling stuff. And I, next quarter, I decided forget it. I don't, you know, doesn't really matter. I don't really want to take it anyway, right? And so after doing that, I realized how important language is. As a cultural kind of identifier, I realized how important language was. I mean. You know, in South Africa, there's 12 official languages. They're all official. Most is one of them. Zulu is, is the most. Um, Afrikaans. Um, but I realized how important that was to to the most of people, and also to the Afrikaans too. That was the language that's really important to them, how they identified. And I never thought about the use of language in that way, and how important language is. And I also realized if I'm gonna, you know, I also want to learn myself. I want to work with, you know, the youth. I should learn myself anyway. But this whole idea of this kind of this solidarity through language I never never crossed my mind before, and I regret not taking Spanish continuing through, and um, that's one of my goals this summer to do. Um, here's a I don't know if you, uh, you can hear a little bit of me. In Kamalam Bukaya, the Kondeuba Mandense, the channel in Chaense. Anyway, it's like a couple minutes long, but it's it's a cool language. Um, I can. Speak a little bit after if you want to see it. It's, it's cool, <laughs> but it's, it's the click language. So if you're interested in linguistics too, it's like a basis for a lot of stuff because um, the clicks take a place of like the pH and the F, the, the, the English kind of crazy stuff that we have the exceptions, the rules. So anyway, moving forward now, you see that the end is near. We're working our way through. Um, so for those who know South African history, um, I think what the next day is Robin Island. So I went to Robin Island. Um, Robin Island is the place where Nelson Mandela was in prison for you know 30 plus years, where everyone who was against apartheid were, 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 were imprisoned for a long time. And, uh, I finally had a chance to go. It's, it's like an hour ferry ride from the mainland, which you can see from, from, from Robin Island, you can see it. Um, which is another whole tempting how the prisoners could see it, but they couldn't go, it was a whole other complex. But this was you know, by far one of the most amazing things I did as well, because what makes this special and unique is that an ex-prisoner takes you around who actually lived there, that was a prison there. And there's always talks, there's not, you know, some are getting older, some don't want to do it anymore. You know, it's not, it's, it's, it's not going to be around forever where you can have an ex-prisoner who was there explain their experiences to you. So that was just beyond the powerful to, to, to see that, to have him take you around um, to the place where he was in prison, where he had to sacrifice his life for no reason. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, I went to this tour. Um, so this was a huge blog. I talked about my experience. I went, you know, all, I saw all these different things, the cells and whatnot. But um, here's a little bit of part of what I wrote that night, uh, reflecting on this experience. I said, you know, you read about things in textbooks, you just see pictures, and it touches you, you frown, you say to your neighbor, can't believe that was like that. And then you turn the page of that book or toss that picture aside, not because of anything malicious, but because it is just that, a picture of some words on paper. Robin and Adam brought those words and pictures to life for me. Quite frankly, taking foot in that prison and hearing from an ex-prisoner puts life and freedom in a whole new perspective. I think about society and race every day, especially near my trip to South Africa, as you know. So I was aware of that. 
But you know, so in a way, I came around and I'm looking for answers to my life, you know, you know, which in, in, in a very naive way, you know, I came to have these, you know, answers in terms of the way I thought and my feelings and my, my explorations of what I've talked about. But after going here, I said the opposite happened even more. I left without answers and instead left with more questions. I saw the agony in the ex-prisoner's eyes, I sensed the pain in his words, and I felt the unrest in his heart. Maybe it's the good in me trying to find some kind of logical reason and making sense of what occurred at Robin Island. Same for the Holocaust, I can't explain it. Perhaps no one will be able to be, ever be able to explain how or why these events happened. And I just, it was just, and, and not in so much an academic way, but I, I couldn't help but not share that experience because it, it, it was very, very powerful um, to, 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 to do this. So as you can see, there's a few pictures. Robin Island, this is the gate going in. Of course, it's not for cons. Um, um, so here's a few pictures. So here's Mandela's cell where he stayed for 30 plus years. Um, there has been some criticism about the cell immediately after he got released. Apparently, the rumor is Afrikaners knew that they were kind of losing control. They kind of polished the floors, cleaned them, you know, made it look a little nicer. But still, that's the cell. It's not very big. That's all he has. That's where he stayed for, for you know, 30 plus years. Um, um, and he can't skip the picture here. Yeah, okay. So here's the limestone, limestone workplace. Here's where Mandela and the prisoners, they chipped away at this limestone for nine to 10 hours a day, every day. You know, even the limestone, of course, wasn't in need. Um, you can, if you see this cave in the, right here is where they went to the bathroom every day. Um, and the, the thing in the middle of the stones and the, and the rocks, um, the tour guide said um, in 1995, Mandela, and they all, a lot of the prisoners came back one more time to have a reunion and they talk about their feelings, and they have put a rock, lit a fire, they thought never to come back here again. So that's still there. Um, obviously, some do come back because they're tour guides, but others did it. Mandela apparently was part of those who built that structure and led that reunion, and that's still there. Um, so I took some video, and this is another video. You can see, just to hear the tour guide's little clip, he's talking about the conditions of some of the inmates. Um, so I'll go back. to the big day, um, but not yet. I, I put in the 14th, so we're almost a week out till I, I leave, and said, I'll show you real amazing. This is a reflection on, on which, is, which I built up of, just to how how beautiful life is, how beautiful kids are, and, and just recognizing this. So I say, being here really puts life in beautiful, gut-wrenching, and simple perspective all at the same time. You know, I go to Crystal House and see the most beautiful children who literally have nothing, who live in homes the size of my bedroom, and are full of life and energy every minute of the day. Can you just leave me in all in all learning about these kids' home life, their immense struggles, and to see not only what they accomplish in the classroom, but how happy, positive, and full of life they are. I can't explain it. We look at so many things as being amazing. I mean, we think look at the iPhone, we look at being able to sky, we think about modern medicine. I said, but yeah, 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 you know, these things are amazing, no doubt, but you want to see real amazing, meet some of the kids, can learn about their background and their home life, and you will see true amazing. It sure is how it puts my graduate school application process on like icing on the cake. At the time, now it was September and I was applying for graduate schools. Um, and I was so nervous, you know, if I get in somewhere, and, you know, I, I was worried. And I promised myself in August I would just not worry about it. But September, I had to start thinking about it. So I was coming home in a week, and so I was putting all my applications together. And I just reflected one day, like, what the hell am I so worried about? You know, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm beyond fortunate. That's besides the privilege that I have. It just it was a, it, it keeps things in perspective. And I still go back and think about that. And going, going through this, again, really gave me kind of kick in the pants and realized, hey, I'm pretty lucky to be who I am. Um, this was one day I visited the second grade classroom and they were talking about my story, they asked me questions and um, I actually, my Amanda, you saw, my teaching assistant, she took a few pictures of me interacting with the kids. 
Um, um, this is another student, same jacket. <laughs> uh, um, that you saw earlier, Alonda. And then this is another student, Tubbs. We had like a spec, that's what everyone called her. We had like this special handshake, it was really cool. Um, so. so this is another video put in context. So one of the teachers I really got close with during lunch breaks and whatnot um, was a kindergarten teacher. They called it Grid R. And so I said, like, oh, come to my classroom one day when you can. So I came to her classroom and you know, they started spelling my name and that type of stuff. And this video is just precious. Um, so I had to show it. Um, so here we go. It's like 30 seconds. Or so. Name's Angela. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, no one has a name Barry in South Africa because you roll your R's in Afrikaans at least, and this is like a tough name to handle. So no one's a, it was it was it was tough, and my name was Barry. I still gonna roll my R's, but anyway. Just like I never figured out. Critiques of the schools is the demographics. Um, most of the teachers are all colored. There's only a few. I think there's only one teacher who speaks Tulsa. Um, all the teaching assistants were, but they were never promoted, which is another issue which I talked about in my critique of the school. Um, but I love that clip. Um, so that being said, uh, we're one we're one block away from my return back to the mainland states. Um, this is probably the biggest day of all. Um, when, I, when, I, when I went back to read it, think about like, kind of my framework of how I'm rethinking race in, in, in life. Um, so I said empathy, not sympathy. Um, again, it's the same jacket. Um, toward a sincere solid, solidarity, I say. And this is the kids going home one day. Towards the end, you can see my hair is like, I needed a haircut so bad, but I was like, oh, I'll wait. <laughs> um, so I'll read this too. So I said, the thing is, we tend to look at the depressing side of it all. And I won't sugarcoat it because there are undoubtedly, undoubtedly aspects that are tough to bear and extremely sad. But it's important to not just have sympathy for the people and communities as if they are inferior, but to have empathy. This is a, this, there is an important difference. And this connects to my beginning framework at the beginning of the trip. When I, when I, when I, one reason I wanted to go is because I wanted to you know, help the kids and whatnot. You know, kind of that whole type of, um, you know, I can, I can help them and use my health type of thing. But, it's not about sympathy and pity, and, and that, if there's anything I can take away, that's one of the things I can take away, just living and working in a community for so long, um, is that it's not about that. Um, so I arrived, there was at least seven or eight of us, oh, this, is, this is after a township tour. We, um, there was a few other interns at the time who were there, and some staff hadn't been to the townships, and so they took all of us on the tour um, of the townships, and they also met a parent one day. And so, um, so we went on this tour, and we met her, met, met the, uh, student's mother, um, the house was extremely tiny. Um, and when I said the, said the size of my bedroom, I was wrong. About half the size of my bedroom was more accurate. I think I was talking about my South African bathroom. It was, it was really, really tiny. Home. Anyway, she welcomed us with open arms. Each and every one of us said she was truly delighted to have us visit. We stayed only for a few minutes, but it was a beautiful display of warmth. There was no pity from this mother, but a nonstop smile, as this was her home and her life, with all her daughters and certificates of achievement from Crystal House taped above her on the wall. It never ceases to amaze me the incredible perseverance that people have. You would think of all you would see is that people hanging their heads low about their situation, but that's not the case at all. And it's kind of just my own privilege in my in, in, in growing up in so many in such a different contexts. And, and, you know, and, um, and I say I just can't tell you how insane it is. You look, you look at these pictures and you almost want to cry, right? I admit I definitely do, and I, there are definitely nights I did. And, and I said, but then you see the smiling faces, like the video before, and the energy such, of such wonderful children, you realize it's not about sympathy, but about empathy. Now, I mean that by saying that there's no good to pity them for what they go through, and they do go through more hardships than most of us can ever imagine in our dreams, but admire them for their strength and their achievements by showing empathy and support for how they're living their lives. And just, th th that whole dynamic um, was, was a big shift in my framework in terms of the work that I, I, you know, I want to do and of how I work with, with people, how I'm 
um, a part of communities, and, and, and I'm sorry, as of communities. So just this whole framework drastically changed. And that was the very end of that trip, and, and that connects to the beginning of where I went. Um, and so to wrap things up in my trip, um, I wrote a whole, you know, tons of notes on my reflection of my experience and whatnot. Um, but just as a clip, I will say just the final day, I put one part, um, my favorite quote, I say at the end of my whole blog, I say at the end of my final blog in Africa, I can't help but think back to a quote that my wonderful former English teacher once told me in high school. Um, that was from a poem that said, may great kindness come of it in the end. Um, and I just kept thinking about you know, what kindness came of, of this experience. And that's how I ended my, all my 100 pages of notes of, of me rambling on about the things I saw. And, um, so we made it from Cape Town. Now we've got to go back to LA. Um, so it was, as I go back, I definitely can see myself, you know, personal changes and how powerful it was for me, as, as Dr. Morrell said at the beginning, in terms of I had read all this. And it, it, and I didn't talk about the beginning either. I mean, I had, I had immense privilege to be able to do this, to be able to go to South Africa. And though it was financially a burden, I still was able to do it, no doubt. And so um, I was lucky that I had this chance to do this type of transformative experience to put myself in a situation. Um, and, you know, it did, it did change me. And I, and I read about so much theory and so much, you know, um, that was so new to me, so much theory and so many things that just being there, um, had a large impact, and, and I, I definitely can see changes. I can see changes now from where I was as well. And I know also changes 2015 Barry compared to 2012 Barry, so the new 2010 Barry. So it's a continual process. So on the back end, since research is important, and I do hope to be a scholar, um, you know, I did also go wanting to help the school. And I mean, the mission is great, the people are great, but the school itself is relatively new, and the structure. I have some suggestions for it. And it's funny, I was looked upon as, as, as truly like, as an expert, I mean expert in, with a capital E. Even though I was an undergrad, I took a few classes in education, I was considered this expert from America coming you know, to, to help with the school. And so I met with the board member of the school and the principal a couple times by my suggestion. So I put like a 15 page uh, critique and suggestions of how to improve the school because I really do care about the kids and the staff, but the structure is kind of on that kind of business model on a lot of things. So um, a few things I said um, just from my report, um, increasing independence and self-sustainability. Part of my job was to kind of help create a career program for these students. For like, they don't have, there's basically no kind of guidance counselor type of career-oriented path. So I kind of constructed the path. And I said, there needs to be more stress on kind of you know, the self-sustainability as, as people, as, as citizens, and that, that wasn't happening at all. And I think a lot of students came back trying to help, you know, asking the guidance counselor, help, I don't have a job, I dropped out of school, I need help, you know, because they weren't really prepared for what was on the other side of, of school that they were really privileged to be a part of, if I can you know, say that. Um, school expectations are called matriculants, I said, not graduates. Um, I said, you know, keep expectations high. These kids are really bright. You know, I got to, you know, I was still considered this kind of young guy, so I mean, I connected with them on, you know, that type of level too. When they come see me, I had to work with them with an essay or whatnot. So it, there's so much potential. I want to make sure I stress that in my report. And also, for, and, also, the backup plans for ones who don't go to school. I mean, they had no backup plans. And they got out of school, there was no support, and they were back on the street after 12 years of schooling and being part of this program in the school. That's unacceptable. So I want to uh, talk about that. Of course, curriculum issues. And I, I, I tell this story, and it's, it's so true. I had read so much about cultural development pedagogy and whatnot. So, and anyways, th that was new to them. And I, I was helping in the computer lab one day. And I, um, and so no joke, these are the 12th graders. And they're, they're doing a report, all of them on Johann Sebastian Bach, the composer. I'm thinking to myself, of all the people they could be learning about and reading about and writing about, that's who they're, I mean, you gotta be, you gotta be kidding me, right? I was just thinking, not that he isn't important in a way, but you know, I, I, I didn't even know about him. I couldn't really help, you know? But, so part of my, my, my critique was, you know, some kind of cultural development pedagogy, and I, and I said I'd be willing to help with scholarship if you need to, you know, examples of that. Another the thing I mentioned was teacher diversity um, in the school. Um, and this was you know, rather controversial, and I, I knew that when I, when I read this, but I said it anyway, that they needed more you know, black teachers. I mean, it was, goes without saying, but at the time, you know, so that, that was a big critique I had in school. And as to the school pride spirit, they didn't have a lot of assemblies when they did. The kids loved it. In one assembly, one of the eighth graders sang a song, Sam, and then play went crazy, and the crystal had, and they loved it. That, I, I felt that was needed to kind of have a, a, a school community, which connects to lack of community outreach. I mean, there is no community involvement in the school and the kids. They were busted in there, busted out, and that was it. And I just felt that was detrimental to, to, to the whole learning process. So that was my critiques of the school. 
Um, okay. And so implications, suggestions, and thoughts. And so as I think about you know research, I think about you know CRT and stuff like that. You know, I I, I could break it down this way in terms of these invisible influences. Now, obviously, they're not invisible to, to people of color. They're not. I mean, they're not invisible to me as much anymore, but they still are. But in so many ways, they were super invisible. You know, all these things. Uh, as I as I worked through these. Um, you know, unrecognized racist tendencies, they were invisible to me. Um, these, these inferiority, superiority complexes that I had deeply ingrained in me that I knew weren't true, but I still kind of felt them for whatever reason, the reasons which I'm reading literature and critical race theory and critical theory and stuff. Um, it was invisible to me. And the lack of cultural solidarity, I never thought about that concept before. Um, and the failure to confront things openly and honestly, just the fact that I could just talk about it was just a big step. I never. That, 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 that was never even an option before, you know? I, and, and it wasn't like, I remember, and I talk about this a little bit, I, I wrote a racial reflection for a class at UCLA about, I always had a tendency towards race, I always was fascinated with my friendship with my, with my friend in high school, but I never really felt like I could talk about that or whatnot, so I never felt comfortable to do so. Um, of course, it's the ignorance on how powerful race is, and these unconscious prejudices that I have. So I have, you know, all these invisible influences, as, you know, as someone, you know, white, and I, you know, from a research standpoint, you know, how does that you know impact you know education policy? How does that impact policymakers? You know, of course, classroom pedagogy, white teachers, and of course, students. You know, we're we're, we're reading that. We, we know every day. You know, from, from CRT and working with with students, you know, critiquing um, society. Um, so that's from kind of like the, the model uh, in a way in terms of you know thinking about um, what these things mean and what I kind of you know really kind of really experienced and really you know solidified at least in my heart. But I also wrote about those of us here already know these things, right? That's not, this isn't like revolutionary. We know these things, you know? And I'm learning to know these things too. I will continue to learn, but for many, for many uh, people, those are, already, those are already known. So as I end this, I'm thinking about, you know, how do I move forward? Um, what does this mean? Um, and so I'm, for those of you who know me, I'm very interested in history and I, I enjoy history a lot. And, and a lot of my work will be in that. But, um, I also am interested in race, just from like a, a personal, intellectual, emotional level. And um, so I, I wrote, I'll read this. I said, you know, as a plan of action, CRT uses the methodology of allowing marginalized voices to be heard, effectively sharing their experiences dealing with oppression and racism. And within education, these voices, and especially those of students, should be shared often and loudly as part of school curriculum and brought out by teacher pedagogy. Yet, you know, how can white race traders or white allies, as Charles Mills and Margaret Tatum says, respectively, um, help shift this paradigm of us versus them? You know, what, what is my what is my positionality in that paradigm of, of, of thinking about and, and changing us versus them that, um, that I never knew I was a part of uh, for so long? Um, so I said, you know, while CRT exposes the effects of racism on people of color, and increasingly popular whiteness studies also exposes white privilege. You know, I said both approaches fall short of documenting the process of how to move a, a well-intentioned, let's let, you know, let change the world type of person, but often misguided from a traditional liberal framework to a more critical approach in their pursuit of good. And I think about, you know, as Veronica mentioned to me the other day, you know, you know, a, 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 how does a, you know, a white male teacher who's good intentioned, who doesn't have an opportunity to do something like this, um, move, have a more critical approach in, in his work? You know, I think about my mom all the time, and, and mom, I love you so much, and you see this, but you know, and she, you know, it's just the most beautiful, amazing, warm person in the entire world. But she, her, you know, her language and her diction, and in so many ways, she has so many of those unconscious prejudices that she's not aware of. And how do I move someone who is such good-hearted to think about, um, to, to re-examine themselves? Um, so, in, in, in a way, um, um, this was kind of a documentation of, of my journey that I continue to write. Um, um, so that's how I thought about this experience in terms of my, some of my interests on the side in terms of thinking about um, where I fit in in this paradigm um, as a kind of critical scholar um, who would not implicitly apply to critical race theory, but also wanting to, to go forward and still contribute to how we do society. And, you know, and last, I know I'm probably going overboard, check the time, goodness. Okay, so my final push in education, so I always want to end on a positive note. And as I connected to my AERA experience, which was extremely inspiring to see so many people there care about education, and then extremely frustrating to see that the bar hasn't been moved in 40 years, and I said that, you know, we talk about all the wrong things. So I wrote that, um, you know, we talk about everything in education except race, except culture, except solidarity, except community building, except student voice, except teacher pedagogy, and except love, you know? So we talk about everything except those important things, and, and, and that's something I, I want to always include in my work and going forward, think that that has to be, that has to be needed. So I hope today, as I wrote, was a, step, a small, very baby steps, uh, step forward in talking about those kind of right things. 
in, in, in the pursuit of, pursuit of justice. So um, that's all I got for you. <laughs> um, please, I mean, questions, comments, answers. I mean, yeah, I, I know when I, it's, I know when I go back and I look at this presentation two, three years from now, I'll probably say, I can't believe I wrote that or I said that, you know, if I read this video. So it's a continual process, and um, I appreciate you letting me share this experience with you because I haven't had a chance to do so, and I've been wanting to do it for a long time. And I want to put these thoughts together into a book or something, and um, any feedback is helpful. So that, that's it. <laughs> So many ways. There's so many of those who, who, who aren't, who, who are, are fully conscious of their actions and their language. But I, I do truly believe some are unconscious, and it's, it's unconscious not in, in a. They're, they're unconscious. They should be conscious of it, and I'm not. And so when I'm thinking about this question, and I'm not excusing that type of behavior. I'm not. I'm not excusing that unconscious language or the microaggressions in any way because it's not an excuse. But some, you know, people, you know, my mom didn't go to college, she didn't read this, she has no idea about these type of, uh, of you know, the whole idea of institutional racism. And as I work with her and I, and I talk with her, it's just starting to see. And, oh yeah, I didn't, I didn't realize I said that, I didn't realize that thought. And I'm not excusing that, because it, 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 it's not right. And, um, but to answer your question, um, you know, I don't really know. I think that's, and that's what I was trying to, to work through. I mean, you know, how does, you know, I wrote that one blog about the whole, you know, the, that, you know, equating socioeconomic status with, with you know, uh, loving households, or uh, vice versa, or other things, troublemakers, and not recognizing resistance. And I unconsciously said that, even though I was trying to be conscious of, 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 of how I was wrong before. So it's a, it's a tricky question, I think. I think that, in many ways, is the next step. And that's, in many ways, that's how I see some of my future work. And how do I, as I continue to, 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 to work through, you know, feelings that are, I'm unconscious of, I'm conscious that I have feelings of, of being unconscious, but how do I document that? How do I think about that? It, it's, it's a challenge. And I was very much, um, when I was reading this, thinking about you know, what is unconscious, what is conscious, you know, how can I control, you know, is it because I thought this, and what made me think that, and, but it, can I excuse that as an excuse? And, you know, and it's, it's a tricky question. You know? and, and, and also, in many ways, you know, I don't want to also just totally, because there, there are, of course, those who just, and this is kind of buttered on, colorblind ideology, all that kind of conservative right type of stuff that you hear, and that's, they're never going to change. And I have family members who that probably not, and I try. But there are some, and I believe, you know, whites who do want to do the right thing, but aren't aware of these things, as I wasn't, because I wanted to do the thing. I volunteer a lot at UCLA, but like I said, I have no idea of these invisible influences. So how do we, how do we document that? How do, how do, how do, I mean, in a way, I feel like it's, it's, it's something I want to do to explore. So it was a long-winded answer that didn't answer anything. Well, if I could follow up with that, because yeah. I was thinking about the same thing in terms of, um, so, you know, how conscious are we really? Yeah. And when it comes to unconsciousness, and so you can just talk for a few minutes yeah. about how do you take up unconsciousness? What, how yeah. do you conceptualize it? Is it yeah. just being unaware, or is it something much more criti critical than just not being aware of? Is it sort of, you know, we have various people, we can talk about educational philosopher Maxine Green, and she's always talking about this process of being and becoming and reaching toward freedom. Yeah. So yeah. when you use the word unconscious, yeah. what is it that you're really talking about and what are you after? Yeah. Well, that's a, that's a good question. Um, you know, I definitely think unaware is part of it, but that, but that doesn't excuse that's just being ignorant of or embracing that. So I, I don't want to excuse that ignorance in any way. Um, I would say unconscious in a way that I'm unaware of, not of society, because saying you, you're unaware that, that there's wealth indifference, or that racism exists. It's, just, it's, it's I don't even, it's, it's it doesn't even worth being mentioned in so many ways. That's just pure ignorance, in my opinion. But sometimes being unaware 
of specific actions because of that. Even though you, you know, people who say, you know, I know things aren't equal, I want to change things, and they want not, and that kind of rhetoric, they're unaware of how those, how that larger structure affects their, you know, their, their language or their microaggressions or their, their thoughts. So not unaware of structure itself, because that I don't want to, I can't excuse that. I can't excuse the ignorance of not looking around and saying that you have a lot, and people who are of color don't have anything, and you go down the street. You know, I'm not. That's that. I don't. That that is an excuse, and that's ignorance in a way to, to me. So I, I, I think unconscious in terms of, of but and this is a, also when, what is good and what is bad. How do you separate that? We put benevolent actions that have microaggressions and that are unaware of that. So almost in a way, you know, I want, I really did want to help the children, and I, but you know, I don't want to, you know, excuse myself for thinking that type of framework. But the same way, I don't want to super criticize myself either. I, I, I do want to criticize myself, but I also, I don't want to slash my intent. I mean, it, does intent matter? In terms of actions, I mean, and that's an open question. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, because I, I mean, I'm critical of so many friends and family. I'm almost too critical of people's actions these days. I'm almost like, well, you're just you're just wrong, and people aren't aware of that. So, I mean, I guess to answer your question, I, I don't know. I think that's that's, I think that's the tricky part. What is unconscious, and what can be excused, and what's ignorance, and what's being, you know, benevolently unconscious. And so, I think in terms of more, uh, if I would say something would be. Acceptably unconscious, nothing's acceptable because that I don't want to ever think acceptable because we can always move forward, and I continue to do that too. But um, not of society, but of, of, of actions, benevolent actions um, that you're conscious of that are actually you know, racial um, in ways. But it's, it's, it's a question that I continue to work through, and, and, and what is unconscious? It shouldn't even be using that word in terms of, you know, because aren't you all conscious of everything you do in a way, right? So. What, what impact? So unconscious of not your action, but unconscious of what caused you to think that. Oh, you can pull this up. Oh, thanks. Um, <laughs> you talked a lot about accessibility and inaccessibility yeah. um, in your perspective, but um, how many interviews or talks did you do about the students' accessibility or inaccessibility? Because you, you seem to have a lot of mobility that I question if they had or even questioned in I think of like Koza when he talks about savage inequalities, how uh, the residents in the Bronx have lack of accessibility, but those who go through the Bronx from Westchester and so on and so forth have, you know, they can intersect and bisect places. Did you think of, or? Do you mean like physically, like going different places? Yeah, or? going different places, for example. Because you were saying how like, you question being able to go to a, a township, but um, did you question those who live in a township being able to go to a Predominantly white neighborhood. Yeah, no, the accessibility is, 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 is I mean, it's not great. I mean, no, there's not. I mean, the public transportation, um, and there is public transportation, but I mean, students, I mean, they're actually, I, I did something with a friend. And, and so, in terms of physically being accessible, that, that option's available. It's not as much as me. You know, I, I ended up renting a car in the last three weeks. I was driving on the side of the road, by the way. It's the scariest thing I've ever done in my entire life. But besides that, I mean, I, I was. For me, it was accessible to me, so I could really see the stark difference. I could really see that. Um, but like I said, students think at home. I mean, it's, it, they they've been to nicer places. They you know, and they, they they do have accessibility. It's not as much as it should be. Um, they, in many ways, are very much segregated to that community. Um, the public transportation isn't the best. It is not, but there is some. So that'd be in terms of that question. Does that help or? You mean in terms of more? Well, I guess I should have framed it better. But I mean, when I say physical, I mean are they like physically like? able to be in that space, like, are they, will they be removed or will they be accosted in some way for even being able to go in that space? See, and that's, and that's, um, I mean, and, you know, 15 years ago, probably, yeah, so that's the whole South Africa's trying to, and I, I always made this comparison, I don't even know how accurate it is, you know, this is how I imagined how the 1940s might have been here, you know, in or 1960s, right after the Civil Rights Act, you know, people are starting to come together, but they're still kind of some race, and, so, I mean, there, each year, I mean, I, I talk to a lot of people and staff, and, you know, you know, it's much more acceptable now for students of color to go to college. It's much more acceptable, but it's, it still is stigmatized in a lot of ways. They still are stigmatized. And, I mean, they just ended segregation, you know, less than two decades ago. Um, um, so, in terms of that being, you know, acceptable in certain spaces, uh, it's, I mean, it's relative to South Africa, it's improving each year, but it's still not great. Thank you. Thank you, guys.